attacking loneliness tumble. Don't really know how to do that, actually. I don't really feel that lonely right now, so, um, sorry, I don't got anything for you. Hey, Barry, how you doing, man? Yeah, you know, you know, Barry, I feel like it's just been all business between you and me lately. You know, we haven't just sat down and talked in, like, forever. How you doing, man? How's the family? Mm, mm. Yeah, really? Oh, wow. Tell you, tell you what, you know, we gotta get this done, we gotta do this video. How about you and me just go out for a drink tonight, you know? Just you and me. Just talk about, you know, life. Yeah. That sound good to you? Yeah, okay, cool. Cool. Alright. Uh, so, yeah, neat. Okay, game face on, Barry. Here we go. Alright. Hey, everybody, how you doing? Teching here. Welcome back to the Espada series. I know we took a couple of breaks from that because I wanted to do those videos on hollow evolution and hollow techniques, you know, like the Cero, the Bala, the Hiero, and all that stuff, because we'll be referencing that quite a bit throughout this series. And it's been a while since the Espada have been in Bleach. Hell, it's been a while since since Bleach, right? But I wanted to keep in mind um, that, that big announcement that's coming up in March is about only a week away. I told you that wouldn't take that long, right? When we uh, got the announcement at like the end of January, here we are midway through March. Um, there is a uh, the Shonen Jump YouTube channel. I'll actually link to it below that has the live stream so you can go to there and you can uh, set a reminder for it. Uh, when it comes to my time zone, it's going to be March 20th at 8.45 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's at least when the stream is set to begin there might always be delays there might be some other stuff i don't know but just in terms of like the stream that i'm looking at that's what it seems for me so we got a week a week until big bleach news now what could that bleach news be well i've heard a bunch of things it could be something really small like something video game related or it could be something really big um the two popular things that people are really excited that it might be is number one like a continuation of the anime into the thousand year blood war arc just like picking up where the anime left off after the lost age and arc and just diving right into the last arc. Something else I've seen, though, is that an, an entire reboot of the entire anime, like just doing a whole new thing, starting from episode one and just building up to the very end of the manga. And you know what? I'd be okay with that, too. We could relive some of those great moments from Bleach. Like, imagine, like, Ichigo's fight with Byakuya, like, reanimated in, like, a better, you know, like, a, like by a... I would love for Studio Madhouse to do it, because I love Studio Madhouse, because Hunter Hunter and Helsing and all that. But even if that's not the case, like, that would be cool. And we would eventually get the Thousand Year Blood War arc anyway, um, just done, like, a kind of like a Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood angle with Bleach, where we cut out all the filler, and we just dive right into the uh, the manga material. So, yeah, I, I don't know if that's going to be the case, but those are the two things that I see a lot of people talking about online. Um, it could be something else completely unrelated, like, from an anime. It could be something else going on. But, um... That's what I think a lot of people are excited for, so we'll just have to wait and see. We got a week until that, so we'll see what it is. All right, so today, though, we will be talking about number one, Primera Espada. We're just doing it, right? Coyote Stark. I love this guy. Also, technically, Lilinette, because Lilinette was also the Espada as well, because they were both part of the same body and they split. Uh, it was originally assumed that Stark was, you know, the Primera Espada, and then Lilinette was just, like, his Fraxion companion, but it seemed that we later found out, no, they were both part of the same entity. Um, if anything else, Lilinette was more of Stark's, like, sealed power. Normal Aronkars or Espada, they would store their powers within swords or weapons. In this particular instance with Stark, who, by the way, did not become an Aronkar because I and, you know, messed with him with the Hogyoku, he was already in a wrong car by the time Aizen arrived and found him out in the middle of the deserts of Hueco Mundo. He had divided his soul into two halves, so Lilinette and Stark, when they merge together, that's when his resurrection actually occurs, okay? So, a lot of really cool stuff to talk about Stark, but there's something I gotta bring up right out of the gate, and you know what? I just realized this just now, but Let's go through this. I want you to see this, okay? Because it's a little bit of an injustice here to the Primera, okay? So these are all of the Bleach Tonko Bonds that include Espadas as their uh, as the covers, you know? Okay, because Kubo likes to draw the, the images for the covers. You know, really, really large, just, you know, characters, bombastic, really powerful covers here, okay? So first we got the second Espada. We got Baragon. Like, all right, cool. He's looking neat. Then we have Haribel. All right, I mean, like, boobs. All right, you gotta have boobs on the cover. All right, cool. Neliel, former third Espada. Also, once again, boobs. Okay, although, the, the, if you noticed, the, uh, the English Viz releases of these tend to put the Bleach logo right where they're, you know, for some censorship purposes. The Japanese versions of these books do not include that. Um, Ukiora has two. 
makes sense. You know, we got two Faruqi Aura, one in his regular form, and then one in his uh, in his first Resurrection, not in his Segunda Etapa, but still, you know, Ukiora, very prominent character, kind of like Ichigo's one of his main antagonists, so there you go. Um, Noitura gets one, all right. Uh, Grim Zhao gets two, once again, rival character for Ichigo, one in his normal form, one in his Resurrection, makes sense to me. Okay, fair enough. Loopy gets one. And then we have Sile, and then we have Yami. So that would mean, if I'm remembering my Espadas correctly here, there are only three Espada that do not get a cover. Zomari, which, okay, I mean, he only had that, like, one battle. Uh, Aranero, which, pfft, yeah. And then Stark. Okay, uh Oh, okay, come on now! Really? Come on now! And I went back and just to check this. Alright, so the volume where Stark releases his Resurrection... Okay, no, alright, alright. If it's a choice between Stark and Holly Bell's... Okay, that's, that's fair. Okay, that's fair. That's fair enough. But the chapter, the volume where Stark actually dies and he fights against Shunsui and Love and Rose and everybody, that's volume 43. Alright, now look. Bargon's cool, but... Yeah. If I had to choose, you know, actually, could you, like, Stark and Baragon together? That would actually be a cool title, because very rarely does Kubo do that. There's not a lot of Bleach covers that have more than one character on them. But I'm just like, that's a little weird. Isn't that a little weird? You know, he's the only, like, major Espada, you know, because Zomari and Aranero once again. But when it comes to Stark, though, all right, I just, I just noticed that. I just wanted to bring it to your attention. All right, so first Espada, Coyote Stark, uh, what to say about him? He's got guns. That's what he's got. Not these kind of guns. Oh, yeah, these guns right here. I mean, I'm sure, I mean, all of the Espada are, like, pretty ripped. You know, even, like, Sile, that's like a lab rat. He's pretty ripped as well. But no, I'm not talking about those guns. I'm talking about these guns. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, Stark, kind of like the design of, like, a Wild West gunslinger. I love this dude. Uh, he's a very, very chill character. You get it? You know, he's just, he's not like, I am the first to Sparta. I will slay all of you Shinigami in the name of Aizen. He is very loyal to Aizen. He's actually very grateful to Aizen for, um, basically just helping him not be lonely. <laughs> because that's the tragic thing you got a lot of these Sparta, okay? They're all based off of, uh, one of the aspects of death that, you know, one of the reasons why humans die and some of them are like you know you get like wrath and you get things like um you know like madness with sile you know wrath or rage would be yami you know which really reflects their personalities which you know whatever it's like like yami's like i'm a big tough guy that gets really mad and i'm gonna smash you i'm like all right fine but then you get to the really tragic ones like ukiora's nihilism and then you get to stark's loneliness or solitude a being that was so lonely that he literally fractured fragmented his soul into two pieces, one of which being a lolly, just so he could not be alone anymore. Which makes it especially sad, because then you start to think, like, the conversations that Stark has with Lil Annette, it's really just uh, an elaborated conversation with himself. Alright, because it's like, he, he did create, like, two beings, and by the way, to keep in mind here, and Stark even mentions this in his fight with Shunsui, when he's reflecting back on, you know, his creation, you know, when he divided his soul, um, I'm assuming that was also the point where he became in a wrong car, you know, Stark was one entity, and then out of sheer crushing loneliness, divided his soul into two pieces, um, and that's also when he became in a wrong car, but he was mentioning that he doesn't really remember what they looked like when they were together. Um, you know, in that, in that previous state. And he questions whether or not he, they even resembled one another. You know, like, you would assume because Stark is, like, the adult here, maybe, like, Lilinette sprang from him, and Stark was the original dominant body, but that's not the case. Um, it seems like it was a completely different entity altogether, probably doesn't resemble Stark or Lilinette at all. And then when it got divided, you know, they took, it took the appearance of these two, right? Um... I was actually kind of curious about that when Stark explained it, because I thought that meant that when Lilinette released her power and they went into the Resurrection, uh, where Lilinette becomes the pistols and Stark takes over the body, although they are able to switch back and forth whenever they so desire. So Lilinette usually takes the forms of the pistols, but she can also take over Stark's body and speak through him, um, and also Stark could become the, the, the wolves, you know, they, they can do this kind of stuff, all right? So it's not really, though, they're 
you know, returning to their original form. It's just that they're, like, cooperating on a much more deeper level, okay? It's like they can never really go back to the way they were before they split. You know, that, that, that tear in their soul was so extreme out of the crushing solitude, they are forever going to be separated, okay? The closest they can get is when they go into the Resurrection and they can kind of speak through the same body, but they'll probably never go back to the way they looked like, um, you know, before that. Especially now, because they're, they're kind of both dead, but, you know, alright. So, anyway, I love Stark, though, because here's the deal. He meets Aizen, and... Aizen, you know, he, he's basically just strolling around Wakamundo looking for strong comrades. He, he notices giant piles of hollows, just heaping piles of hollows, just strewn all over the desert, just crushed and dead. And he's like, all right. I am, my interest is peaked here. Let's find out what caused all this. So he's like walking through the piles of hollows like, hmm, yeah, this is the, wow, there's a lot of death around here. And then eventually, I don't know what Aizen was expecting to find, but he finds Stark and Lilinette just kind of like, you know, huddled around a cloth, which might be a cloth from their former form because the cloth was just there. Like they split their souls and they're all covered in like gooey substances because they just split their, their souls and they have this cloth. So maybe the cloth was part from their original body is like wrap this around us and they just kind of sit there in the in the sand just kind of enjoying each other's company just staring on at the giant piles of death and Aizen's like hey so um were you the ones that caused all this and they're like no they just kind of die on their own we're too strong they get too close to us and our pressure just kind of kills them and they just kind of heap up like this you know, they're just sitting there. And um, Eisen basically, he, he gives his sales pitch. He's like, well, I'm gathering together an army of a lot of really strong warriors. If you would like to come with me back to my home, um, you, you, you won't be lonely. I can introduce you to comrades. And Stark kind of has a moment where he stares at him and he's like, you don't understand. We're too strong. We can't, you know, well, then he starts looking at Eisen and he's like, well, hmm. See, normally you'd be crushed by now, but you seem to be strong enough in order to endure our presence. I didn't even know someone like you could exist. But, okay, are the people that you're gathering together strong as well? And Aizen, in typical Aizen fashion, he's like, well, I guess you'll just have to come and find out. All things considered, at least considering what Aizen did to Baragon, like, mind screw him with Kyokusu Igetsu and rip his entire kingdom out from underneath his skeleton... You know, the way that Aizen recruited Stark was relatively chill. You know, he was like, hey, I see you're kind of lonely. You want, you want some friends? Yes. Okay, then come back with me. Okay. And they did that. And that created kind of like a life debt for Stark and Lilinette, where even until Stark's dying breath, he still... Um, respected and thanked Aizen for doing that. Because that's one good thing. I mean, it's in a bad way because Aizen's, you know, evil. But in a certain way, it's like, in that sense, Stark was fully realized. Stark realized in his dying moment, much like how Ukiora realized, like, what the heart really was. And as soon as he realized what the heart was, and like, oh, wait, maybe nothingness is not really the case. And then he disappears because it's like he's going against his own nature. Kind of the same thing with Stark, where at the very end of his life, Stark realizes, wait a second... I'm not alone anymore. <laughs> and then he dies. So, you know, at the end of the day, Aizen did a lot of really messed up things. And he betrayed, you know, the Espada at the very end of it. You know, when he sliced down Haribel. But that didn't happen until after Stark died. But until his dying breath, I, you know, Stark thanked Aizen for his like, Hey, I, I'm not really sure about your motives and stuff, but... You got me friends. You allowed me to live under the Dome of Las Noches with other Espada that, I mean, yeah, they're not as strong as Stark. I mean, yeah, Ukiora maybe in his, um, Ukiora maybe in his second release is Segunde Etapa. That's, that's a big debate, you know, whether or not, you know, Ukiora was stronger than Holly Bell, Baragun, and, you know, Stark, and even Yami when, you know, he went into Segunde Etapa. Where does exactly that stack up in the Espada? That was always a debate. But even if they weren't as strong as Stark was, they could still all be in the same room with him. Like, all of the Espada can be in the same meeting room with Stark without their souls getting crushed. And Stark, I mean, he's not the kind of guy that openly, like, oh my god, thank you guys so much for being my friends. You know, he would never do that, but you could feel like 
he was happy with the company. He's like, all right, I'm actually sitting at a table with people. Okay, that's that's unusual. That doesn't usually happen, right? So, I mean, he had his wish fulfilled. That was Stark. Okay. Um, some other things that kind of relate to his chill, kind of laid-back personality. Um, when he fires a Saro, it seems like Saros were, her, were his specialty, just like how Ukiora's specialty was the hyper-regeneration. Um, Zomari said, you know, Sonido was his specialty. Uh, Herio was Noitra's. When it came to Stark, it seemed like the Sero because most Espada and Arong cars and Hollows in general, when they launch their Sero, they do it like a, they have to do like a position, like they have to point their finger, or like sit out their hand and like charge it up. Stark is so chill, he can fire a Sero with both hands in his pockets. He's just like, hey, hey, what's up? And then just Sero, and then just fires it off. Okay, so I really love that scene. He could fire Saros off, probably from any part of his body. You know, just like a little bit of focus, he could fire them off from like his his front, his chest, or his back, or his arm. You know, whenever. I mean, if he really wanted to, he could be like Sero, but he doesn't need to do that. So it seems like Sero was his specialty, especially when we get into his resurrection. Uh, a couple of things to mention before that: he did wield a sword, uh, but it wasn't a you know uh, it wasn't like his sword that like stored his power like we mentioned before. No, it was just like a regular sword that he had. I'm sure it was a nice sword. It had a cool, like, you know, guard, you know, a really intricate guard and stuff. Um, but he probably just, like, I just want to be like everybody else, so I'm just going to carry around a sword, even though it's not actually, you know, like, it's not a magic sword, it's just a sword, but I want to be like everyone else. So he carries around a sword, and he fights with Shun Sui with that a little bit. Eventually, when the fight gets really intense, and they start to get to the point where it's like, I'm going to release my true power, my resurrection, he sheaves his sword, summons Lilinette over. Lilinette is truly the, um, the uh, you know, storage point for his true powers, and then they merge together, and then, boom, you got Wild West Gunslinger Stark. It's high noon. Reaper's gun, but I use McCree's catchphrase, because Overwatch, yes. All right, um, but yeah, so this is what he looks like, awesome. Um, I mean, I, I like all of the, the, the top three Espada's release forms. I love Harry Bells, because how could you not? Bargons was cool, when all the flesh, you know, rots off of his body, and he's just a skeleton, you know? And then Stark, when he becomes the, the gunslinger, I'm like, that's pretty cool. Also, it begins the trend where Shunsui always seems to fight against the, the, the opponent opponent that uses guns. Um, this is Bleach, so not a lot of characters utilize guns. Mostly it's swords or other kind of more traditional weapons, uh, more old school. But keep in mind, remember, that Kubo originally wanted this story to be named Snipe, and the Shinigami were going to use guns, and so he, he dialed that back and he restructured it a little bit. But you could see where, you know, Kubo still likes to include guns in his story. So Stark uses guns against Shunsui, Robert Akutron uses guns against Shunsui, Lilia Barrow uses guns against Shunsui. It's like, Shunsui's like, damn it, I always have to fight against the guy with guns. This isn't fair, you know? Shunsui typically always ends up winning, though, you know? Except we uh, kind of with the fight with Lilia... But he had now helping him there. Okay. So, he releases his true form. And at first, it's just like, he uses guns, and the guns fire Saros. He uses Cero Metroyeta. And which is, I guess, like, automatic weapon in Spanish. But, come on. It sounds like, the first time I heard it, and the way it's spelled, and the way it's pronounced, kind of sounds like Meteor Jet. And I know that's nothing close to it. I'm not going to give this up, but come on. If there was a technique, I'm just saying, if there was a technique called Meteor Jet Sero, would that not be cool? All right, come on now. It's cool. But no, it's like automatic fire, you know, Sero. Okay. And so he raises up the gun and it fires off like thousands of Saros in rapid fire automatic movement. Um... There was a couple of extra things added in the anime, because Stark uses two guns. There was, like, a statement that Shunsui made upon, like, fighting him for a little while in a filler where he's like, oh, your right gun, you know, fires a really big shot, but you have to charge it up first, and there's, like, a cooldown period, whereas your left gun, you can fire continuously, but packs much less of a wallop. So it was kind of like a balanced sort of thing Shunsui was beginning to realize, like, this gun fires a bunch of shots that are relatively weak, this one fires a bigger shot, but you have to, like, have a cooldown period um that wasn't stated in the manga at all so and i think even in the anime you know stark was like oh that's how you think this works huh and he could like switch them around or he could he was just messing with shunsui something implied like that but there were a few extra things added into the anime in that in that instance there right so 
Um, the fight kind of gets interrupted, you know, uh, when Ukitake first shows up and uses Sokyo no Kotowari to blast the attack back, because he's like, oh, Shunsui, they're double-teaming you, <laughs> you know, it's not fair. And Stark is like, well, technically, me and Lil Annette are the same being, so it's not really, but whatever. So the fight gets really properly interrupted, though, when Fura shows up with Wanderweiss. Wanderweiss one-shots Ukitake, which I still don't really get, but okay. He goes down, Shunsui gets distracted, you know, Stark takes his gun and points it right at Shunsui's back and blasts him in a saro. He falls to the ground. Shunsui's not out of the fight, though. Then the Visards show up. And then the Visard fight, we have Baragon getting defeated, getting defeated by Hachi first. Then we have Rose and Love going up against um, Stark, okay? And once again, it's like it starts off as like a pretty chill fight where Stark is just kind of like, hey, uh, tell me something. You guys are captains, right? You know, you can do Bankai. And Love and Rose are like, yeah. He's like, show me your Bankai. Stark didn't even get a freaking Bonkai fight. Y do you see where this is a little weird? You know, like, like I'm not gonna say, like, he's a badly written character. I, I, I think Kubo did a pretty good job with Stark's character and the whole motif of solitude and loneliness and dividing the soul. I would have preferred there would have been a little bit more time with him. Um, you know, fighting Shunsui, though, I thought that was a great matchup. Shunsui's one of the strongest Shinigami going up against the Primera Aspada. Fine, I'm cool with that. He even gets a side fight with Love and Rose, who are both captains, former captains that are visors, and he even manages to deal a pretty good significant amount of damage against Rose and Love. But it's like, at the end of the day, it's like, you realize he doesn't get a volume cover, and he doesn't even get a Bonkai fight! Haribel gets a Bonkai fight! Baragon gets a Bonkai fight! Ukiora! Noitera got one! Ichigo fought against him with Tensa. Didn't last very long, but he got a Bonkai fight! Grimjow got a Bonkai fight! Oh my god! Is freaking Stark gonna be the only one? I'm going down the list. Is he gonna be the only one that didn't get a Bonkai fight? Because guess what? Zomari got a Bonkai fight! Freaking Loopy! Loopy got a Bonkai fight! Um, Sile! Sile got a Bonkai fight! I got a double Bonkai fight! Because he got Renji and he got Mayuri! Holy shit! Aranyero, wait! Wait! Aranyero did not get a Bonkai fight. Alright. Okay. Alright, so we got Aranyero and Stark. Yami got a Bonkai fight. You know. Ah, oh, because Byakuya used it against him. I think Renji used Hihio Zabimaru against Yami too. Oh, oh, also, yeah, Tensa Zangetsu when Yami was in the world of the living. <sighs> Sometimes you just feel bad, right? It's like Stark himself, I mean, he never really seemed like, I mean, he was in debt to Aizen. So he's like, you know, I am the Primera Espada, you know? So he took his position seriously out of respect for Aizen. But you never really thought that Stark was like super invested in it. But even Stark, with his chill attitude, at the very end, you'd probably think, like, he's dying. And one of his last thoughts were, like, okay, thank you, Aizens, I don't have to be lonely anymore. But another thought probably entered his head, like, damn, I was the Primera. I was number one. You know, I was number one. I deserved a Bonkai fight. Ah, screw it. I'm coming, little Annette. And then he just, he just ends it right there. I'm like, man, that's... You think back on it now, and it's really not fair, you know what I mean? Oh, okay, so anyway, Rose and Love fight against him, and then this is where he reveals the true power of his ability, of his Resurrection, okay? It's not just these guns, but the bandoliers that yeah, he has, you know? The bandoliers shoot out uh, little fragments of his soul, and they become wolves. So literally, Stark's power, his true power, is to summon the wolf pack, all right? So with his mighty wolf pack, um, he can send these wolves out to attack his enemy. Originally, Love and Rose erroneously assumed that these wolves were like compressed Sero, because Saros seemed to be Stark's thing up until now. They figured he was just taking Saros, making them like sentient like pawns, and then sending them out. The wolves bite somebody, they detonate, ba ba boom and then, you know, okay. However, Stark explains, he's like, they're actually not Saros. What my ability is, is I have the ability to literally tear off parts of my soul 
Kind of like, uh, that's actually applicable. I have Harry Potter back here. By the way, I'm on the seventh book. Just started it today. So, kind of like a Horcrux kind of deal. But in the sense with this, you know, he can divide his soul kind of infinitum. He can divide it into as many parts as he really wants, really. Uh, there seems to be no limit because he can create like an entire army of wolves. It seems like he can divide his soul and then merge his soul back, at least with the wolves, whenever he wants to. The big divide that happened when, you know, he originally divided his original body into Lilinette and Stark into two different bodies it seems like you can't go back from that but it's just like dividing your soul into these little fragments and creating the little wolf soldiers he can do that and he can merge them back into his body if he wanted to right um so when he does this though it seems like Lilinect takes control of the body of Stark and then Stark takes control of the wolves and they could switch back and forth Lilinette takes control of the wolves sometimes and they can go and attack the enemy right and because they're fragments of his soul not just Saros they pack a lot more of a punch like really big explosions that were enough to you know severely wound Rose and Love if it wasn't for their hollow mass their hollow mass even got shattered when they were attacked by the wolves right however the wolves have a little bit of a drawback because literally Stark is dividing out his soul so much if the wolves get to destroyed um you know his soul fragments are getting destroyed as well there so that's kind of dangerous now stark has always been stated to be a really really ridiculously powerful espada so he could divide out parts and fragments of his souls and probably even like you know this one wolf is one percent of my total soul but it's still really strong you know okay to the point where the explosion is really large but it's only one percent and it's not that big of a deal in the larger scope of things right so, it did look like if, you know, Shunsui did not get involved at that point in the battle, Love or Rose would have had to use their Bonkais at some point, but Shunsui does get involved, he activates his, uh, his, uh, um, Kage Oni, Shadow Demon attack, you know, Stark lands, he's like, this is gonna be the finishing blow. Hey, check it out, I'm kinda like a main villain in this story. Stark! Oh, okay, okay, what the- Stop! Alright! We're doing this, I guess. Oh, all right. And then Shunsui's back. Shunsui's back in town. And we get the real, um, you know, uh, Kyokatsu. We get, not Kyokatsu, we get to. Katen Kyokatsu. All right. There's a lot of Zanpakutos that start with Ks in this story. Kazashini. Kyokatsu gets. You know, uh, Katen Kyokatsu. All right. The true power of that is revealed to be making children's games reality. So Kage Oni, Taka Oni, Iro Oni with the color demon, the mountain demon, and all that stuff there. So he continues the fight. Uh, once again, in the anime, they added some extra scenes here. This is something I'm actually kind of glad they added, though. In the anime, there was an extra scene where... Shunsui manages to use a combination of Kage Oni, Oni and um, to lure the, the wolves in and then they all detonate and then he attacks them with his Busho Goma, his like spinning top technique. And in the anime, it's implied that like Lilinette dies. Like he destroys all of the wolves and Stark is left well and truly alone. And the expression on his face when he realizes this like... <gasps> And there's this moment where, you know, he summons the swords, you know, to clash against Shunsui one-on-one. -on -one, and eventually Shunsui uses Iro Oni to, like, slash him down. Like, Iro Oni, black. And then seems to, like, once again in the anime, it's given a little bit more detail. In the manga, it's just, like, Iro Oni, black. And then Shunsui just cuts down Stark. In the anime, it's shown, like, black because his hollow hole is black. And Shunsui's wearing his Shihawk show. So he's, like, black. And then he just, like, dives his swords directly into the hollow hole and it shatters apart, and that's how Stark dies. Um, I was a little bit curious about that, because if it's a hole, why would it have a color? Because it's a hole. You know, you can, it's a hole. But, all right, fine, whatever. And, and that's, like, poetic, I guess. So, that's how Stark dies. But, in the anime, when it's like, oh, shit, Lilinette's dead, and he realizes he's alone, because Lilinette's, like, he's been his companion for longer than he can remember, like, probably decades, maybe even hundreds of years until Aizen came along, right? Um, and so he realizes that, and then he dies, though, and when he's about to die, he thanks Eyes and, and remembers all of the Espada. <laughs> except for Yami. That guy's an asshole. He remembers all of the Espada, all of his comrades except for Yami. Although I guess you could say because the Espada are like walking in front of him because he was number one. And so number two is right next to him. And then number three, like, they, they, the higher the numbers, the, they, they get further away from him. Maybe Yami was behind him, but he doesn't remember him in his flashback. So I like to think Stark just like, oh yeah, Ukiora, he's okay. Baragun, yeah, he's a little arrogant, but it's okay. Yami Tommy, ah, screw that asshole, I don't like him. It's like, I'm, I'm coming, Lilinette. And then he dies.
and he, he dies. And um, at least, like at, at the death of Stark, at least, um, not that Eisen felt any sympathy for him, but after Stark died, Eisen felt like, all right, this is this is a mess, this is over, and he immediately slices down Hari Bell. Hari Bell is still fighting Lisa and Hiori and uh, to, to, uh, Toshiro. Uh, I was going to say Totsugaya for a second there. It's like Toshiro Hitsugaya. But, um, you know, he realizes, like, this fight isn't going anywhere. You know, number one is dead. Number two is dead. Number three is going to die eventually. They're just all going to group up on her, so there's no point anyway. So Aizen slices down Haribel and is like, all of you Espada were far, far weaker than I even, you know, even even in my lowest estimates, you guys were still weaker, so whatever. It's like, Kaname, you know, Gein, let's get moving, right? And so that's the end. Kind of an unceremonious end to the Primera Espada. Um, you know, he did get a flashback, just like Baragon did, so at least we got a little bit of more there. Uh, Baragon's flashback was more involved because he was the whole, he was the king of Hueco Mundo. He was the god of death in a lot of respects, you know? So there's a lot of stuff to, like, unpack with Baragon. But Stark just seemed like a lonely, strong soul, wandering the deserts of Hueco Mundo, looking for companionship, even if he had to rip his own soul asunder. So, not really much, like, gravitas as much as, like, Baragon had, but just, you know, not as much of a story there, but still a story that was told, so that's at least something. Hari Bell's flashback, we didn't even get in the manga. That wasn't something that wasn't expanded upon until the anime, so at least we got something there with Hari Bell, right? I mean, she deserves at least that much. Um, and we got Ukiora's in the Unmasked data book, so that, that was something there. Um, but I just felt like, you know, his character was interesting, his backstory was interesting, we got that, his ability was interesting, I guess at the end of the day it really just came down to I wanted Stark to have a much more intense battle. Um, I know just because it's a shonen battle manga doesn't mean, like, every character has to have a crazy, crazy powerful fight. You know, there's other things involved here. But I feel like, yes, with the number one Espada, considering we had the huge epic fight with Ukiora, who was only number four, and we had the fight with... I, I feel like out of all the three Espada that came to Karakura Town, the one that had the most elaborated fight was Baragon. You know, because he had the whole fight with, you know, Soyphone, and then Hachi got involved, and we got his backstory, and then we got, you know, the whole Jakuhu Raikoben shot. Everybody had to work together there. We got a really elaborated battle there with a lot of interesting different like keto attacks and stuff starks at the end of the day was just like i'm really strong you know but you know he ended up getting defeated by shun sui relatively i mean i don't want to say easy it wasn't an easy fight but stark uh but but i mean uh but it, it but we saw the end of it shun sui love and rose all came out of that fight relatively in one piece they were banged up a little bit but not really all that much um I guess you could say also at the end of the day, though, Stark, despite being really, really strong and despite being the Primera Espada, wasn't really much of a fighter. He could fight, but it's not really in his nature to do that. Like I said, he's a very chilled out guy. So he's like, I can fight, but the whole thing, and I will fight if Aizen wants me to because he helped me. But the whole, like, thick of battle, like, pulling out my guns and, like, all right, let's do this, Captain of the 8th Division, you know, doing all that stuff, like, yeah, I'm getting into this fight. Not really in Stark's nature, so that's why the fight just didn't, you know, go on as much as I would have liked it to. But, yeah, that's the situation there. Although, just like a lot of the other Espada, we did get um, the Can't Fear Your Own World. We got the Hogyoku Fusion with Stark, which looks amazing. Actually looks like two in there because of Lilinette's soul as well. We got the combination of blue and green and his bandoliers, you know, his magazine becomes like Riatsu, you know, like little little Riatsu tags of bullets that like just siphon into his sword and just like, like that, that would have been a cool design, right? So Hogyoku Stark, pretty cool, right? Um, but yeah. That's, that's the Primera Espada, which I feel like you'd think that the Primera Espada would have the most, you know, you know, like the longest video, but I guarantee you he's probably not going to be the longest, um, because Grim Zhao and even Baragun's video might be longer in that respect there, and we all know how long I could talk about Nelio's and Hari Bell's boobs, that's probably like a 45 minute video just locked in right there, but anyway, yeah, that's the first Espada, Coyote Stark and Lilinette Gingerback, the two lone wolves that found each other. Have a great day, everybody. Signing out. All right, Barry, how about how about tonight we hit the bar? All right, cool.